Hello and welcome to the BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. I'm Orlando and we're here today to talk about exciting ingredients, cooking techniques and general kitchen chat. Plus, we have an original Tom Kerridge recipe for you to try out at home, whether you're a beginner or a budding chef. Hi, and welcome to this week's BBC Good Food podcast with Tom Kerridge. Today we're talking about pumpkin and all things Halloween. Don't be too scared because we have Tom's killer recipe for pumpkin soup coming up in a moment. But first of all, I've got a serious question for Tom. With Halloween coming up, do you believe in ghosts? No, don't be... No! Oh, come on! No, I don't believe in anything like that. I don't believe in anything I've never seen. Like, I can't... Like, if you can't... I, I... I, no, I don't believe Never ghosts. had a little ghostly experience in no. the dark, woken up in the dark and had a shiver down I, your spine? I, well, that would be telling, I've got to be honest. <laughs> However, I'm fairly certain that didn't involve a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm disappointed in you because I would have had you down as the man who thought, who would say, well, you never know quite what might be out there. But nah. no, you've closed your mind to it. You won't see one if you don't believe in them. Uh, like, honestly, if you can't, if science can't justify something, for me, it's all about science. And, and it's about things being proven. And otherwise, it's a conspiracy theory and it's ridiculous and it's make-believe and it's fairy tales. However, that doesn't mean to say that it doesn't exist. If someone can prove to me they exist, great, I'll accept it. I'm not non-accepting just until the point that somebody says, yeah, yeah, ghosts are real. Here's the proof. Then, you know. You're inviting I, a thunderbolt to come down on you. you I, well, I am. Listen, I'm 45 years old, right? And if I haven't seen a ghost up until that's 45 years of my life, sure. Like, you know, what are they waiting for? If there is a ghost listening, come and visit Tom, is my suggestion. Yeah, so, but, <laughs> yeah but don't be a scary one, please. Don't, so don't be scary. Do one. I take it that you hate Halloween as well? No, I quite like Halloween. I quite oh, like... You, can't, you can't have one and not the other. You can't be not believing ghosts and enjoy all the ghosty stuff. I like the party stuff. Well, that's like saying Christmas. Come on, we enjoy Christmas, don't we? Like, I even dress up as Father Christmas. Like, you know, it's Oh, quite... you'd make a good Father Christmas. I can see that. Big white beard, my the whole lot. My son is completely convinced that Santa arrives. I do a very good impression. In fact, it's one of my best fitting suits. <laughs> <laughs> do you do Halloween? Do you have a Halloween party or a bonfire night, bonfire night party? They kind of morph together now. Yeah, they do. They? No, I enjoy going. I do enjoy doing it. My little man loves it. The idea of dressing up, like all kids do, they love dressing up and being a part of it. Last year, it was a werewolf, which was great. Oh. And then this year, who knows what we'll do this year. But And I love going out. The, you know, fireworks nights are amazing. They're brilliant. You know, oh, I do love, and I, I love the time of year for food as well. And it's very special. I love being outdoors. I love, I love baked potatoes and sausages and all that sort of stuff that you associate with Halloween and bonfire night and those sort of dishes. They're just great did you do halloween as a child or was it more bonfire night i think it was, bonfire it was more bonfire night, night. yeah i yeah. think again it's a generational thing where we're a little bit older bonfire night was massive you'd all have a big bonfire with a guy on the top and you'd all learn about guy forks and we'd have sausages and baked potatoes and and and, and, and sparklers and and the potatoes were always um, too hot and burnt your mouth uh, sausages were too hot as well and burnt your mouth you, generally it was a burning kind of experience exactly wasn't it? and uh, and toffee apples and all of that sort of stuff and they pull your teeth out they pull your teeth out it's a whole out. hazardous event this isn't it <laughs> But it's super fun. It's great. You know, I, I love it. But Halloween has become much more um, of a big thing. I think it was probably when I was about 10 or 11 that trick or treating started becoming quite a, a thing that people did here. And like 35 years later, you know, it's a massive thing. Everyone enjoys Halloween. It's a big, you have Halloween parties, those sort of things that happen. So I, I like I like it. I enjoy I enjoy people in, having fun. That's great. I love being a part of it. I'm interested that you talk about trick-or-treat because where I live, which is in Exeter, the trick-or-treating has stopped. And I figured that all the kids were being kept in because of health and safety or something because we don't get them anymore. I always was equipped with coins and sweets and things. But in your area, are they still trick-or-treating like mad? Yeah. People and your go son out. goes out in a trick-or-treat yeah, pack. Yeah, last year he thoroughly as enjoyed As a werewolf. It. Uh, yeah, as, yeah, as a werewolf yeah, last year. I bet he was year. the most scary of all of them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, he didn't have to have a costume. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I hope he's not listening. <laughs> That's very, very mean. But food tastes better in the open air, doesn't it? There's something it... special about occasion. No, it's not open air, it's occasion. And it's food that fit. And this is where food is so... But where's some of the best meals you've ever had? And some people talk about, oh, restaurant this and that place there and that place. But actually, some of the best meals you've ever had would have been things like an ice cream sat on the pier on a hot summer's day or fish and chips on a beach when it's freezing cold in winter and wrapped up warmer or, and then followed by a hot chocolate or a, they're, they're things that where it is outdoors but they're occasions they match things a, a lovely wrap somewhere at a festival or, or a thing that just all those sorts of stuff that are encapsulate what well, that's what makes food special so it's not just you know it's not just about it being outdoors it's everything that's about it celebration people friends family the occasion and all those sort of things add to it even if it is sausages and baked potatoes that are too hot that's a food memory that you remember and i bet you've been for some really expensive meals that in your life that you've gone don't remember that but you can remember the burnt or the hot sausage yeah. that you had at, 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 at um, a fireworks party some point when you were seven or eight. And I was quite happy to be burnt. It was good fun being yeah, burnt. Yeah. You know, probably the first time I ever burnt my mouth. And I burnt it quite a few times since. It was when I fell in love with English mustard. Oh. I remember that. I remember having English mustard on a bonfire night because I'd never had it before. And it's a big flavour and it's a big taste. But I remember being about seven or eight and having it and thinking, oh my God, that's making me cry. And then thinking, but that was amazing. It tasted fantastic. And that's, you know, that I remember those are sort of things. The falling in love with English mustard is 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 a great thing to have happened, and that's way better than eating in any Michelin star restaurant. I've got something poetic for you now. You're going to be really, really impressed. Poetic by life po- is going to rhyme. Po- <laughs> well, almost. Okay. Shelley said that his idea of heaven was to have a spoonful of mustard followed by a glass of claret. I get it. It's lovely. What mustard would he have had? Ah, uh, well, he was an Englishman, so I would have thought English mustard. Yeah, how maybe, hot maybe not, the, the, yeah. not the Coleman special, but no, no. but it's a it's an attractive idea. So you're you're a follower now of Shelley, are you? I, I, I most definitely, yeah. I did go out with a Shelley once. <laughs> uh, Tom, which is your favourite firework? Oh, no. So the, uh, <laughs> now my fireworks are very different. So. Well, New Year's Eve, we always have big fireworks, okay, wherever I am. You're well, a firework meister, are you? I, you I, actually I run it. fireworks. I was just meant which was your favourite in the display. You mean you actually send them up? I, I, I do, yeah, and oh. I love it. So what I do, so, so I gave up drinking over six years ago, right? So I decided on New Year's that I would spend the same amount of money that I'd spend on booze over Christmas and New Year on fireworks, which turns out to be quite a lot of money. <laughs> so I am now a pyrotechnic engineer, I now could do, actually, if they wanted me to, I could do the fireworks on the Thames on New Year's Eve. That's, <laughs> that's how good my firework display is on New Year's Eve. Do you it's start that, planning I, it months before or do, do you kind of order a display? How does it work? Yeah, you, you, you speak to the big fireworks people and you say, I want to do this and I want it to, and I want it to end with a massive explosion that really upsets all the neighbours. And they send it, send it out in a box. You give them a massive check and, and you get a huge box of fireworks. You have to spend the day like digging trenches and setting it all up somewhere in the garden. Warn everybody that it's going to happen. And then off they go. And is the last one, the one that goes really, really, really high, disappears into the sky invisibly. And then there's the most enormous bang and the whole sky fills with light. Is that the last thing? Pretty much, except it's that times about six. So it goes up into the sky, it goes bang. And then there's about another five after with loads of different colours that keep coming out and coming out. That is how to spend fireworks evening with a hot sausage in your mouth and English mustard. I'm just going to look in your direction on New Year's Eve and yeah. see, I'll see it from hundreds of New miles Year's away. New Year's Eve fireworks, like we do it twice a year. Look at, yeah, Make New sure Year's... you don't hit any satellites. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to talk pumpkins in just a minute. But before we do that, baked potatoes. Can you give us a lowdown on baked potatoes and what we should be topping them with? I oh, see. Now, there's loads of different things. So when you start off as a kid, you just cut them in half, put them in a bit of butter and then some baked beans. And they're charred right? on the outside because they've been in the bonfire. Yeah, yeah. However, I quite like the fact of baking them. Right. So to make them super posh, you bake them, then take them out, cut them in half, scoop all the potato out, mash it up with a fork and your cheese and your bits of bacon and some chopped chives and some bits and bobs. And yeah, then chives make, have an affinity, don't they? Yeah, that oniony flavour that's delicious. Yeah. And then put all of that mixed flavour back 
in so you bake the skins then where you've scooped it out to make them nice and crispy. Oh, then heaven. you put then you put the mashed potato mix that you've all put together back in, sprinkle some grated cheese on the top, back into the oven or under the grill, and then you've got these amazing, like delicious cups of baked potato that are just fantastic. I mean, they are just stunning. Is that too good for the kids? No, kids should be eating <laughs> great. Although, although it would be, you'd spend all that time and they go, What's this? Why, why? I mean, it's like, this isn't like normal baked potato you do. This is, I mean, what is this? I bet they like crunching the skins as well, yeah, the kids, baked, wouldn't they? Everyone loves a baked potato skin, don't they? Yeah, yeah, it's the best bit, isn't it? Sausages. Yeah. Any particular recommendations for sausages? You can go wrong with sausages. They can be bleak and dull things and kind of gummy, can't they? Yeah, I, w- I mean, I would say good, some, good, supermarkets do some good ones. However, I would support the local butchers and get the butcher yeah. mix because they make their own amazing sausages. And yeah. go and see your local butcher and buy sausages from them. And they are, you know, so, and speak to them about what you like. You know, you, there's loads of great sausages out there. They're, I mean, you go from like gamey ones with venison in it and beef ones and beef and mustard are delicious but i like a straight good sage and onion basic seasoned english banger that's what yeah I like. full size not the chipolata full thing. size yeah full yeah. size proper sausage in like delicious and then how do you cook them uh, me yeah so i it varies some people I, I don't mind them going through the oven but when i was a young commie chef I, I, in a restaurant, in a hotel, my first hotel that I worked in, um, it's called the Painswick Hotel. It's very, it's a different place now. And the, is and that the, in Gloucestershire? It is, Pains, yeah. Pains, a very pretty village in Very pretty village, yeah. yeah. That was my first place to work. And the owner there was a gentleman called Somerset Moore. And he was a very robust, strong Englishman with, like, to wear tweed and roam around his hotel. You can imagine that old school hotelier. And he was lovely. But he insisted every morning on the sausages for breakfast always being fried in a pan. So they were like proper bangers. So it was like old school, old school. And, I, you know, I tend to agree with them. I think they're great when they're fried. Old fashioned sausages fried in a battered old frying pan. Yeah. So done, done, like, done like they should be. And you prick them first so they don't explode. Yeah, we don't really need to do that so right. much anymore. So because the skins are now normally synthetic. So what used to happen is this, oh, they were called bangers because the sausage skins used to be made from part of the animal yeah but now then and not... they used to explode and hit you in the eye exactly they? they used to pop so yeah. now that that's why they're called bangers but now oh, you don't you really learn something to... on this podcast there you go <laughs> uh someone i knew who who used to enter sausage competitions i know that sounds a really th- odd thing to do but he was a sausage maker he swore by the method of poaching the sausage putting the sausage into cold water bring it to the boil so it was kind of cooked through. Yeah. And then he would sizzle them in a pan. But he always knew they would be perfectly cooked through because he'd brought them to the boil from cold water. Yeah. Do you think that's a faff? You, you, it sounds like you don't no, bother I with think, that. I, I, no, I think that's probably a great idea. I think that's a really good idea. And then you can gently colour them up in the pan. I quite like the idea of that. I, I mean... And get them all over golden. Yeah, i got to be honest. For So in one of our... Re- actually, in two of our restaurants that we serve breakfast in, some for the rooms and some because we're open for breakfast, is we actually actually gently poach our sausages in uh, oil at 65 degrees so they're just cooked oh. and then when they come on order we take them out of the oil and then we fry them so they get this lovely crisp skin so they're just beautifully moist in the middle cooked deliciously so that's kind of not exactly sous vide but you've po- you've they're, they're poached in oil very you similar to the a very lower controlled temperature so they're just cooked and they stayed nice and moist and, and not dried out so so that method of kind of cooking it first i, I he was onto a winner well, he did win lots of competitions with them. So there we go. I, I, thought, I thought it was a good idea. And once again, we find ourselves recommending digital thermometers. Yeah. Uh, anyone listening, I'm really sorry. If you haven't got a digital, digital thermometer, you're kind of missing out. We've had some uh, questions on via Twitter from our following on Twitter about marshmallows and toasted marshmallows and s'mores. Do you do s'mores? I mentioned I asked a friend about s'mores and she said she didn't know what s'mores was. I, I'm I'm with your friend there. Okay, what is a s'more? It's an American campfire thing. Yeah. So uh, it, obviously they're busy on Twitter. On Twitter they know all about s'mores. Yeah. Um, it's something where you toast a digestive biscuit sandwich with marshmallow and chocolate in the middle and then you eat it. Is wow. that new to you? How does that, that is sound? new to me. Is that going to be turning up soon on a menu near you? Probably not on a menu, but it might be something that happens at home. I could see my little man loving that, although, you know, 
that's a lot of sugar and calories. However, it does sound delicious. Yeah, it's quite small and it's only once a year. Yeah, very true. Yeah, <laughs> Then definitely we shall be doing it this year, dressed as werewolves, <laughs> toasting digestive biscuits, marshmallows and chocolate all together. Have you ever cooked on a bonfire? <laughs> yeah, we've done quite a bit. I quite enjoy it, actually. I'm not talking about a wood-fired <laughs> oven. I mean your actual bonfire, Tom. Yeah, no, once it's, the coals have gone down, once the wood has cooled down, it's quite nice to wrap things in tinfoil and stick them in there and see what happens. I do that a lot when things with heat I do... I do lots of things wrapped in foil and throw it do on. Do they go at the happens. bottom? Or yeah, you put kind it on the hot. bottom and leave it and see what happens. It's how like, how do I see what well, depends, happens? It's, yeah, exactly, that, see what happens. That scientific approach that we admire in you. <laughs> yeah, I like, yeah, just ch- well, check it You come in. back late, what, several hours later? Or a couple yes, of hours? D- yeah, exactly that. So something like a lamb shoulder or leg, wrap it up in loads of foil. Oh, actual I've food. Done. I was thinking of something lightweight. You're actually making dinner, burying that in the bonfire. Yeah, yeah. exactly that. I've done that a number of times where we just wrapped. In fact, my dream, what I'd love to do is dig a massive pit, set fire to stuff in there, then put in a whole lamb, bury it, come back two days later, see what it's like. That's it. I'd love to, like, kind of like, uh, there's a lot of North African and Arabic cooking where they do that with goats. And in Hawaii, they do that with a pig. I think yeah. the whole pig gets buried. Yeah, I would love to have a go at that. I'm just it's trying to find the right leaves. place in the garden. <laughs> <laughs> you wrap it in banana leaves, I think, to keep the soil off. Yeah, I haven't got any bananas. I ain't got any banana plants you in my garden. You could beg some banana leaves from a neighbour with green fingers, I'm sure, to, to wrap it up in. And would you be doing this without the knowledge of your wife and son? Or would they be digging this pit I, with you no i so i've mentioned it to my wife before and she says yeah mm. and that was that so so we've kind of so it's kind of like well if you're going to do that do it on your own somewhere so i'll do that but my little man will be well up for it, it will involve a digger i mean anything to do with digging is you're, cool. hang, you're not going to hand dig it no, you, I, could, you could borrow a grave digger. No, I will, I will hand dig it, but with a digger. No, I will, I'll do it. No. I'll do it with a shovel. Could, I will, I would get rent, on it with a shovel. Uh, renting I, a little digger would be good. Maybe you could do a few earthworks while you're at it. Well, you know, dig for a little pond or something. Yeah, maybe start Just laying some idea. foundations. Maybe if I sell it to her that we're building an extension, she might go for it. Or a spa for her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or an outdoor bath. That's what it's going to be. Yeah. It's an outdoor bath or, just with a cooked pig in it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure that you can get that past Beth somehow, yeah. can't you? <laughs> Still to come on BBC Good Foods podcast with Tom Kerridge. It's a fantastic ingredient. They have to reduce it down and they gather in their sugar shacks and boil the syrup for days and days. They're probably visited by ghosts and all sorts of things ghosts happening in there. Ghosts don't their... exist! <laughs> <laughs> Now, we'd better talk about pumpkins because people are obsessed about pumpkins and they loom large, literally, in a, in a lot of lives. Um, there's a bit of a problem with pumpkins. In the, I'm sure you do pumpkin carvings with your son, do I you? I do, yeah. And you get the stuff out. Yeah. Uh, someone on Twitter said that they keep bending spoons, but I think the answer is to get some stainless steel spoons that don't bend, don't you? Because <laughs> I, think, I think the answer there is they, yeah, may, maybe invest in a bit of a better spoon. They, they can be got non-bending spoons. But you get all that stuff in the middle of the pumpkin, that stringy stuff. The seeds, I know you could separate them out and toast them, but you get all that stringy stuff. That we all have to throw away, don't we? Yeah, yeah, there's, no, there's nothing in that. And the flesh that we scrape out as well, so that we can get the eyes and the nose and everything... That is kind of, it, could, it is pumpkin, but it's a bit second-rate pumpkin, isn't so it? So the problem with the pumpkins that you use for cutting is they're cultivated to be pumpkins that we make faces in. Not eating pumpkin. They're not about the flavour. If you want flavoursome squashes and pumpkins, start looking for something to Those pumpkins will work, like, you can eat them, but they're not the best. They're not the biggest of flavours. They're not the strong. There's so many different types of squash out there that are around about the same time of year that are just delicious search them out they've got richer flavors they've got beautiful textures they're nutty they're sweet they're savory they're 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 a wonderful ingredient and the one that's around all year round is the butternut squash and i know it's a cultivated one but it's one that gives that lovely kind of pumpkin flavor that 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 comes all year round and my favorite pumpkin by a long way is crown uh crown prince pumpkin it's amazing in today's recipe which is coming up to in a moment called pumpkin and bacon soup you suggest crown pin 
prince pumpkin or onion squash. And the onion squash is the red, the rather red one, which is shaped like a great big red onion, but not a purple onion. Exactly. That, that's yeah, the yeah, one. Yeah. But yeah. they're the ones with flavour. They're yeah. delicious. That's I think we one. just have to bite the bullet on the inside of a carving pumpkin and put it in the compost or something like that, don't you we? You buy because... the carving pumpkin because you're carving it. Forget about it as a food yeah. item. Think of it as a house decoration, table decoration for a fiver. That's what you're thinking about. Yeah, it. I mean, it's, it's not such a big deal, if, if, but... It's just not not for eating, is it? Not really. I mean, you can eat it, but it's you know, if you're going to find a pumpkin to eat with, find, go go to the farmers market and go and get something with big, robust flavours like those two. Even so, there is a slight problem with pumpkins in the flavour being a bit delicate. Do you is that got around by having exactly the right pumpkin, or is it the way that you cook it? Is no, that it, important? It, no. It, Knowing pumpkins, you, that would be important as well because you like to take such I think good you care need of your ingredients, don't you? Intensify flavors, and you can do it by baking things, covering them in tin foil, and cooking them in their own kind of juices and steaming them. But again, it comes down to finding the ingredient in the first place. Another nice little trick is if you use two thirds pumpkin, one third sweet potato. If uh-huh. you're looking at making like a mash or something, that in enha- that sweet potato enhances those natural sweetness and sugars and earthiness of it, it. You're mixing what is a root vegetable in with this kind of grown outdoorsy vegetable, but has that flavour of it being rooty, that autumnal flavour. So mixing those two together, yeah. they're amazing. Yeah, it's strange they're not related, but they behave and look rather similar, when don't cooked, they? There they are. Yeah, Some yeah. Odd quirk of vegetable fate, that isn't it. It is, yeah, it is a little strange. Do you serve pumpkin in your restaurant? Yeah, we do, yeah. You do? We use That's it. interesting because there's something slightly uncouth, well, not uncouth, but it's quite rustic, a pumpkin. Yeah, but everything I do is about rusticity yeah. that's celebrated and pumpkins work so well for that. And treat a beauty, that when you blend them and you make them into soups or purees, they have they naturally have this velvety-like texture. They're, they're something that's so... They go very smooth and creamy, don't they? Uh, yeah, they're incre- They're so luxurious in terms of texture. They're something that, you know, if you compared it to clothes, it would be like stroking the someone's someone's beautiful dinner jacket it's one, you yeah. know, one of those lovely or velvety, cashmere yeah, a cashmere jumper yeah 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 it would be it would be like hanging it'd be like giving I don't know Elton John a hug that's what it's like <laughs> it's kind of like this lovely well looked after beautiful this is so sensuous this podcast isn't yeah. it we cover everything <laughs> don't we from from textures to sounds that's to ex- taste there to we go. looks yeah and do you do anything else with it? Do you make pumpkin bread or any? Do you do pumpkin desserts? You can do, but yeah, I, I do like a pumpkin pie. I do like a set pumpkin pie, a little bit like a custard, but, but it's it's like a nutmeg custard tart, exactly the same sort of flavours, but it's more, it's dense, okay? So it, it's kind of, it's, it's a set vegetable puree with eggs, but it's delicious. It's yeah. fantastic. I love pumpkin pie. My yeah. mother was American, so we used to have pumpkin pie as a kid. So but she beautiful. would use the tinned pumpkin, which you can get, and actually it's very condensed and the flavour is good and it's very bright orange they've cooked it down to get it in the tin so I think that's an example of a it doesn't taste at all tin an example of a really good tinned commodity I think yeah it's if a, you it's can a get great it. way of using a pureed kind of built together thing that will work so well to make that kind of pureed custard thing that yeah. you're looking for and the spices are important in a pumpkin pie spices aren't they? are so important it, like mace cinnamon nutmeg all of those sort of things that give, give make it taste of autumn yeah I think well pumpkin needs needs those things doesn't it? in itself it's a rather delicate flavor so you need to help it along by flavoring it with spices and herbs and seasoning is something that we haven't talked about yes. i think your seasoning must be incredibly expert but how do you go about checking seasoning i heavily season we heavily season in restaurants and at home salt and pepper are big for me i like they're big big things and i know People are worried about salt contents. But for me, when it comes to food, salt is about flavor, always about driving it forward. So I heavily season because I think heavily season drives flavor. Yeah. It opens taste buds in your mouth. It allows you to taste food for what it is. Sometimes people will see that as salty, but I really, really like it. Some people who have eliminated salt from their diet find it a bit alarming when they eat as it were, normal food. Yeah. But otherwise, I completely agree with you. It's it's very exciting to eat something that's generously salted. And we are probably a bit 
mean with it at home generally. But maybe that's good so that when we come to your restaurant, we are completely knocked out by the flavours. Exactly. <laughs> Punched in the mouth by flavour. That's what you want. <laughs> now, I hope that we've got our soup coming up. We have Jack, our trusty podcast assistant, who's coming over with a pan of hubbly bubbling soup. Look at that. This is the sound effects bit where I try and make it sound like it's in a cauldron bubbling. I don't think it isn't in a cauldron, so we're probably not going to manage that this week. It's in Can a nice some, sauce. It's in a it's very a nice, nice, nice saucepan. Sauce, sauce, a nice, shiny, clean saucepan from the Good Food Kit Test Kitchen has done us proud as usual. Can you hear any glooping? Glooping? No, no glooping. You'll just have to imagine the glooping. It's a gloopy soup. <laughs> and this is a pumpkin and bacon soup. Is the bacon liquidised into it? Some of it, and then some of it is added in extra as the end for taste and flavour. Uh -huh. So it's about it being, I mean, it's about, it's again, it comes back to that seasoning. You know, bacon mm. is salty, it's delicious, mm. it goes, but it helps to enhance and drive the flavour of the pumpkin. It's beautiful. And it's also um, drizzled with maple syrup, which is another dimension. Maple syrup, so... You'll know this because you have American heritage. But I didn't know that the world's maple syrup is normally made each year in between four and six weeks. And that is it. The only time that it can make, that's the only time that the trees give up their sap. And in that period, then they have to make it warm. So all the maple syrup for the world of that year is made in six weeks. Done, start to finish. It's a fantastic ingredient. It's amazing. Uh, because it's totally pure. And it's also crazy the way it's made because they put these little trap things on all the trees to collect the, the sap. And then they boil it for hours because the actual sap is not particularly sweet. They have to reduce it down. And they gather in their sugar shacks and boil the syrup for days and days. I bet they kind of sing songs. They probably have all sorts of weird kind of main rituals. That's Stephen King country. And they have all sorts of... They probably visited by ghosts and all sorts of things ghosts happening. Ghosts don't there. exist! <laughs> <laughs> I was determined to bring it back to ghosts. Because they, get, they get visited by bears. That's that's <laughs> definitely true. What the bears come in search of the maple syrup? Do they? Yeah, they come. They come in search of the maple syrup. So there's normally. So they losing sugar shackers? Are yeah. they the whole time to bears? I oh, know. I don't, away I don't the think the bears, bears are eating the people. The bears okay. are eating the maple syrup. So they chew through the piping. There's plumbing. There's miles and miles of plumbing through the trees. They're on a slight angle all the way down the hills, and the bears come along and start chewing on the on the plumbing because they go, this is delicious. And they probably lie down underneath the broken pipe and just let it drip into their mouth. Yeah. In it, heaven. That, heaven that, for a polar bear. That's kind of, not, sorry, not a polar bear. I've got the wrong bear. <laughs> grizzly bear. Is it a grizzly bear? You are, but I've got visions of like Winnie the Pooh drawings <laughs> of him just like lying there with his big tummy full of maple syrup having a delicious feed. <laughs> well, on that joyous image, I think we have set ourselves up for Halloween and Bonfire Night. So thank you enormously, Tom, for that great fun chat and also this delicious soup. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Happy Halloween. Ooh. Thank you for listening to today's show. You'll find the recipe and thousands more on bbcgoodfood.com. If you have a minute, we'd love to hear from you on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at BBC Good Food.